Right, chapter 14. So this is the videos for cohort B, and this is the chapter 14 moves us to the brink of civil war. In fact, by the end of this chapter, the first seven Confederate states, South Carolina being the first, are either seceding, have already seceded, or on their way to doing it. And so you guys get the... Uh, I guess the benefit of talking about the Civil War itself in class, whereas cohort A is going to get the, the video piece. And I noticed something, and this is a follow-up on my part. Um, tech term, just a quick thing here. Um, changing this to the cohort system, the cohort schedule, I mean, it, it wasn't that big a deal, but I messed up one more thing. And if you notice in Blackboard, uh, Quiz 5 is now done. You guys did pretty good on that one. I noticed this was from, this is a holdover. In fact, it's the wrong chapters as well, this quiz six. So that doesn't even exist in Blackboard. So what I'm going to do is skip it because really we've taken up through 12. And now this last portion of the class, we've got team presentations for both cohorts. We've got that paper coming due the 5th of March. And then we roll into the last presentations and the final exam. So throwing one more quiz in there, one, it seems like an unnecessary waste of time because those last couple chapters will be captured as part of the final exam. Okay. And so I think most of you will be happy. A few of you maybe could have used one more quiz, but honestly, it probably wouldn't have changed much because the overall quiz average, yeah, it's 25% of your grade, but everything else, I mean, presentation, paper, and the final exam is the really big ticket items left. So again, um, if you're grades lower than you had hoped, you still got a lot of points to play for. So um, this going away isn't going to affect anything. And it makes for one less deliverable. So you can focus on the paper and then uh, the uh, final exam. Okay, and again, just as a reminder, if you notice cohort A, I know it doesn't apply to you guys, will finish up um, the Civil War piece and then they'll take their final. And then for cohort B, for you guys, what we'll do that Thursday is kind of wrap up because doing the civil war via video is tough so um, that last day of class before the final we'll do a little kind of hit the really key points of the civil war itself and that'll set you guys uh, up for the final exam and for both classes i'm going to do this i do it all the time is any questions you have because this goes all the way back to mesoamerica and the aztecs but questions you want to go over will take 20, 25 minutes-ish uh, because the final exam typically takes 35, 40 minutes at most. Some people do take a little bit longer. Um, but here's the deal, too. If you need a few more minutes after our class period ends to finish it up, uh, take it and, you know, I'll, I'll write a note to your uh, fourth block teacher. So I don't want you to rush through it, but that review tends to refresh some of those key ideas, even if you're not the one asking questions. So uh, I've seen it uh, very helpful as far as final exam grades going up. Okay, uh, that's it for tech time. So this idea of irrepressible conflict, that means it's unavoidable that we are on a path to civil war no matter what gets done. And now you could argue that the civil war could have been avoided. I think there's a rational argument for that. But that would have had to boil down to the idea of compromise between North and South. And what we've seen through chapters 11, 12, 13 is how uh, growth in the country, how economics, and how these violent polarizing ends of the political spectrum, the, the abolitionists and fire eaters fighting with each other has made this more and more difficult. So I don't know that it was impossible. And the idea that, you know, one more compromise, could we have kicked the can down the road another 15, 20 years? By then, mechanization, which was already starting, may have overcome the need for slavery. And then you could combine more mechanization with gradual emancipation and slowly let the air out of that balloon instead of what ends up really being popping it because um, once the Union wins the war, the 13th Amendment is immediate emancipation. So, yes, now th throughout the war, some slaves do uh, flee, some, uh, you could call it defect, I guess, but uh, come to and fight for the Union and freed blacks on the Union side. 
they have to fight it's not instantaneous but slowly they gain the right to fight for the union as well right? so that's gonna this chapter takes us up to the gates of war so a couple quotes and these would be up to you guys um, to listen to Lincoln's farewell address when he leaves his home in Springfield Illinois to head for the White House one there were a lot of threats against him against his life so he has to um, kind of covertly make his way to Washington in the middle of the night to get there but when he says goodbye to his friends in Springfield he mentions the idea that if or ever he may see them again it's almost a foreshadowing of he'll never leave Washington again of course he doesn't the other is the speech he gave and this is you know a quote from um, scripture about a house divided and he mentions a house divided against itself and he says I don't believe the Union will fall but I do believe it will become all of one thing or all of another and what he's talking about is all slave or all free and of course where he stands again Lincoln not a radical abolitionist but against the expansion of slavery so that gives you the inclination of he's he's anti-slavery in the grand scheme of things and he hopes that one day it will be free now of course he doesn't hope that comes via civil war okay then there's this guy John Brown who we'll see again toward the end and I'm gonna do chapter 14 in just one shot so it'll probably be an hour ish um, but that gets it done in one sitting you can always pause it John Brown tries to start a slave insurrection in Harper's Ferry which is um, on the Potomac up, up river from uh, Washington DC and when he's captured he gives this quote about the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood so again some foreshadowing that he thinks there's a war on the horizon of course he's right now he doesn't see it because he's hung for trying to start this slave insurrection uh, and there's some interesting people in the audience and there's an interesting reaction to the hanging of John Brown as a martyr or as a traitor right? a very polarizing figure in the country a couple words of the day this one it's been mentioned before and I think even um, the folks that did the 1820 compromise mentioned this idea of popular sovereignty a okay? popular being uh, like by popular vote sovereignty who's in charge this idea becomes more and more prominent as we get into some of the compromises like Kansas Nebraska of saying you know what this 3630 line has outlived its purpose and we should let as new countries come in because we've manifest destiny our way across the continent at this point as new states I didn't say countries as new states decide to come in they have to write a constitution and then petition to enter the Union let them decide when they're writing their own constitution if slavery will be allowed or not and you think well that's an interesting idea but as, as states are being formed people can migrate in there and act as uh, you know members of the state and then slide back out there's not the um, the strict nature of documentation like we have today and what that does is it sets the stage for what becomes known as bleeding Kansas as people move back and forth between Kansas and Nebraska either pro or anti-slavery and there's violence involved and in fact John Brown and his his kids hack people to death with broadswords a place called Pottawatomie Creek um, in defense of free not slave in this bleeding Kansas Right, so an idea that might look good on paper but in reality just doesn't seem to work so let's go back a quick review of uh, 1850 the, the the beginning of this decade of peril as we move towards civil war and some of the the pieces of that compromise of 1850 because this is yet another step and it shows the pace is quickening and the divisions are deepening within the country and so the discovery of gold in California a mass migration the gold rush as it's known hence the San Francisco 49ers people going west to seek fame and fortune and so now California the population uh, is booming and it's time to be uh, to petition to enter the Union as a state and um, of course 
uh, California wants to enter as a free state, but there's the pro-slavery forces opposing it because they could still hang on to the argument of the 36-30 line splits right through the middle of California. So really, it should be two states. And so this idea of an omnibus. And again, this is you're seeing this as we speak in Congress, right? The House just passed the uh, COVID relief legislation. Now it moves to the Senate. And we already know one of the pieces the Senate's not going to buy off on is the minimum wage increase. So just like in, in Clay's case, you know, if all these won't work as one, because that's a difficult lift for Congress to pass all these kind of disparate measures under one piece of legislation. And so either breaking it up, which is what happens in this case, or potentially either changing maybe from 15 to $11 or just stripping out the minimum wage piece of that legislation and then reattack it at a later date. We may see that happen now. So this is what's put forward by Clay, the great compromiser. And you can see California is a free state. There was a dispute between where Texas ends and New Mexico starts. Um, we're leaving a load. Remember, th this gag rule idea is still kind of floating around. No reference to slavery and all these other new territories. And we gained a ton of land with that war um, with Mexico, right? The South avoids the Wilmot Proviso, which said all new territories coming in will be free. Nope, thumbs down there. And then strengthening the Fugitive Slave Act and preserving slavery in Washington, D.C. And I asked the question of... Um, doesn't that seem odd? Not the slave, the Fugitive Slave Act. We're going to see the strengthening of and how that inflames the North. But the idea that they're still going to have uh, slave, the slave trade and auction houses right next to the White House in one case. So what happens is we're going to break this up. And because Stephen Douglas, um, probably the leading candidate for president as we move toward 1860, uh, from the Democratic side it says, you know what, if we split this up, it'll be easier to pass. So that's what he does. But even though each of these elements, now some of them are reworded, make it through, it does nothing. In fact, it probably deepens the tension in the country. So yes, California comes in free. This Texas, New Mexico, that's kind of a, a small potatoes piece. Now we throw in the idea of popular sovereignty. You guys coming in can decide now, again, if you think about, if you've ever been to Utah, New Mexico, it, it's mostly an arid, almost desert-like climate, so unsuited for plantation agriculture. But at this point, that's not the point. And maybe it never really was, is it's about power in Congress. So that's the more concerning piece, especially to the, the South, trying to hold on to that. Ado uh, South avoids adoption of Wilmot Proviso, which was the all new states coming in will be free. And then this piece is amended slightly. Strengthening the Fugitive Slave Act remains, but Washington, D.C., you know, slave trade in the capital is eliminated. Mm. Again, it's a little piece of compromise, but boy, it doesn't do much to, to ease these tensions we're having. Okay? So this stronger Fugitive Slave Act, remember that was part of the Constitution itself. That and the Three-Fifths Clause were kind of the bones thrown to the South to get Southern states to ratify the Constitution. But if you fail to help, so I'm a, a slave um, uh, posse out to capture runaway slaves. If you don't help me, if I ask for help and you don't, you can be fined. And if you provide food and shelter, i.e. folks on the Underground Railroad, the fine plus up to six months in jail. Okay? Incentives for those who capture and those who actually judge folks to be slaves. So you can see the problem that sets up is we've basically opened up slave capture to not just runaway slaves, but to free black men and women in the North. Because all I have to do is capture them. Now they have to go in front of a judge and prove that they were freedmen. And that may or may not be possible, depending on if the judge is biased. Okay, And being paid that incentive to judges to judge people as runaway slaves makes the situation worse. So the slave hunters, all they have to do is say, hey, this guy, he's our property, and he's an escaped slave. And the judge says, yep, I believe that. Gets a little bonus money, and this now formerly freed black person is taken drug back into slavery. And again, this is a little bit, um, it happens kind of in and around the 1850s. But the uh, the story, 12 Years a Slave, I want to say Salmon Northrop was captured in 18, early 1840s. So he kind of straddles this 1850 compromise. 
Okay. It was assumed that all blacks were runaways. Arrested and extradited without warrant and no right to trial by jury. Boy, isn't that exactly what uh, helped fuel the Revolutionary War? Taxation without representation is tyranny. So we're doing the same thing, but now we're doing it with human beings, not just taxes. Okay? And so, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a threat to anybody. Imagine, not just, you know, put yourself as a free black in the north and this gets passed. Man, you think you'd be on edge? And, of course, uh, whites, especially whites supporting abolition, are up in arms about this idea of now they can be arrested for helping sustain an institution they can't stand. You can see how this sets up more and more division between the two sections of the nation. Oh, that's a duplicate. Yeah, nice. <clears throat> so what does it do? Well, it further inflames both sides. I mean, the South, of course, they're happy with it because it makes it more um, easy. It's not the right word, but it makes it more likely that they'll be able to get their runaways and maybe snag a few more into slavery. And, of course, the North and especially the abolitionists. But even now, some people maybe that were on the fence or just didn't care or weren't aware of the evils of slavery they've been brought to that by a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin and now you guys cohort B doesn't get the presentation on this uh, cohort A did just by the way the schedule broke down but Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe is a work of fiction but it depicts the evils of slavery and it really brings to the attention of the North what's going on in the South because you know there was sure there was newspapers but you probably read your local newspaper from where you were so as far as full national and even international news much less so than we have now and that's you know one of the differences with the Civil Rights Act in the 60s we had television so you could actually see what was going on here it took Harriet Beecher Stowe writing about it to really open the eyes of many in the North and it increases the push for the abolishment of slavery. This does as well, right? It's like everything that happens adds fuel to this divisive fire. And we're gonna see the Dred Scott decision, which I'm gonna just mention, but jump around because you guys have a presentation on that. So yes, it deepens. Part of that is the old school. Now Calhoun was no big compromiser. Um, Andrew Jackson, not a big compromiser. Clay and Webster more so the idea of Clay being from Kentucky, kind of a border state in between free and slave. They had slavery still. Uh, Daniel Webster from the uh, New, England col or New England colonies. Yeah, flashback to the beginning. Um, they were more able to. We see Clay's name on all kinds of legislation as far as compromise, but they're also gone. And so that um, passing of the old guard, now the new, more vitriolic, more uh, loudmouth elements come to the fore. And so we've talked about these folks, fire eaters, radical abolitionists. There were some, you know, that thought slavery should go away, but in a, a, a gradual way, where they just didn't like it, but they weren't all up in arms about abolishment. So it's the radical abolitionists. And guess what? That term radical is going to be tagged onto a segment of the Republican Party. And Abraham Lincoln's able to keep that somewhat in check, not completely, but when he dies, it opens the doors for the radical Republicans and their agenda. Right? And this is kind of where they come from, where their thoughts, uh, they coalesce around abolition. Right? Militant anti-slavery faction, really on both sides, and a pro-slavery faction. I probably mentioned it, but you know, uh, Charles Sumner be beaten by Preston Brooks on the floor of the Congress within an inch of his life. Right? There were stabbings, there were shootings in and around the Capitol. It was chaos and now add in the uh, the uh, dissolution of the Whig party because of the differences within the party over slavery northern and southern Whigs and so Lincoln a northern Whig is now going to be looking for a new party uh, to hang his hat on okay yeah some funny names out there too and so here we go you know the US has basically manifest destiny itself across so we had whoops 
the original colonies and then the victory of the British over the French and then the victory of the colonies over the British. So we get this chunk, the Louisiana Purchase, the Republic of Texas that enters as, you know, it's an independent country, the war with Mexico and the treaty with England. So just that last piece here for the Transcontinental Railroad. But really the country's filled in at this point. Okay? Here's the actual path of the Transcontinental Railroad. And if you don't know your Midwestern states, they kind of all look the same. North and South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas. Oklahoma is actually the last of the contiguous 48 to come in as a state for a long time. It's known as Indian Territory because that's where the Trail of Tears led to. But there's a, a proposition in Congress about the um, Transcontinental Railroad. We've got rail throughout, but now we've got to traverse the Great Plains and across the Rocky Mountains. And so there's two thoughts. One is a northern and one is a southern route. And that's where that little Gadsden purchase kind of down here in Arizona comes in. And of course the south wanted a southern route because you build a transcontinental railroad each stop along the way they had to stop for coal for water because they were steam powered and so you're going to have an economic um, not explosion but an economic growth along the pathway of the railroad because the towns where there's train stops now have restaurants bars hotels etc and so each side of the country with this being the 3630 parallel, each side wants that economic prosperity to come to uh, its constituents. Now, here's the thing. Guy, uh, um, Stephen Douglas, he's from Illinois, just like Lincoln. And the Lincoln-Douglas debates happen all over Illinois. But he's also got his hands in the pie of the Union Pacific Railroad. And so he wants the northern route, and he thinks, you know, having that, and being able to build it will really cement his uh, nomination for the Democratic Party in 1860 and probably pave the way to the White House. But what's in the way? Kansas and Nebraska. And they're going to petition to enter as states. And so Douglas, rather than trying to inflame either side, abolitionists or fire eaters, he throws out the idea of popular sovereignty. Just let the two states decide. And then that explodes in bleeding Kansas because of the fighting back and forth over entry into slave or free states. So really, in the end, that hurts um, Stephen Douglas and his chances because it makes him look like, you know, he's kind of sitting in the middle and he's causing all this chaos. And behind the scenes is his own personal economic interest. Right? Imagine that. That happens today, too. Okay. So I'm going to skip this, this uh, um, Uncle Tom's. Uh, not that you guys are going to do it, but I basically summed up um, how that's going to work. Uh, it's going to inflame the North because it really shows the institution of slavery. And it angers the South because they say, well, that's not accurate at all. And in fact, it makes it such that any kind of abolitionist uh, propaganda, Certainly the publishing or selling of Uncle Tom's Cabin in the South is verboten, right? It's totally off the table. And, oops, there's a publisher, I want to say it was in South Carolina, who's accused of this, and they burn his shop down, and I think they killed the guy over it. So, yeah, some deep-seated tensions. And, in fact, there's a, a pro-slavery kind of a rebut of Uncle Tom's Cabin published in the South that's, um, you know, much more friendly, if you will, to the institution of slavery. Okay. All right, talking about this uh, Stephen Douglas, the little giant, as he was known. And he thought, you know, well, it just lets the states decide, and that solves the conflict. But what it also does is it undermines the 1820 Compromise, which granted has been just barely hanging on, but it still is. Okay? And there you go, the Transcontinental Railroad. I talked about that against the map. So he says, well, let's uh, organize these uh, Kansas-Nebraska territories. And when you see, I think I have it in here, Kansas is about the size that it normally is, what we see today. But Nebraska goes all the way up to the Canadian border because there is no North and South Dakota at that point. So he wants them to come in and come in under popular sovereignty. So they could either allow or prohibit, put the issue to bed and move on. Because I want to build this bloody railroad. But then 
the disagreement over that becomes the, what's known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Okay? And by passing the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which includes the idea of popular sovereignty, now the 3630 line is irrelevant. So it repeals the Missouri Compromise in the sense that it kind of blows it out of the water because it doesn't matter anymore. There is no line depicting free and slave states. There is no balance of power compromise out there. It's all based on how states want to enter. And now if I'm a pro-slavery supporter, I'm going to send a bunch of my supporters into a new state as it's kind of coagulating around statehood to tip the vote toward pro-slavery. And vice versa. I could do the same if I'm a abolitionist, anti-slavery. Yeah, good. So here's the, you know, the, again, unorganized territories, Indian Territory, Oklahoma, as we know it. Um, New Mexico, Arizona, still not there yet. Utah, Colorado, no. But look, Kansas goes all the way out. And look at Nebraska. It's gigantic. And so if the Missouri Compromise was still in effect, look at all that territory that would technically be coming in as a free state or states, right? Because we can carve quite a few states out of this huge territory. Okay? Notice too, that California is now coming in as a free state. Um, and then these two still open, but through the wording of the Compromise of 1850. Okay? Purple means because of the Kansas-Nebraska Act and popular sovereignty, they can come in as either free or slave. And this area not real conducive to plantation economy but the Great Plains at least more so than the very arid desert areas of uh, New Mexico Arizona Utah okay? so problems breakdown the compromise 1820 is now dead and so we see the buildup of the calling for mass meetings and getting people to rally either for pro or anti slavery because we got to we have to affect how the constitution of the state is written so it comes in in the manner of which we either being pro or anti slavery want it to come in okay so yeah Kansas coming in as a free Nebraska coming in as a free or slave and there's a lot of potential disaster waiting and it becomes known as bleeding Kansas so you have Kansas mostly pro slavery um, because let's go back to the map. Remember, Missouri, under the Missouri Compromise, and right up against it is Kansas, right? Here's Missouri right here. Here's the states that came in under the Compromise of 1820. And so it's right up against Kansas, so it's easy to try to migrate westward into. Whereas if we go up more toward Nebraska, free states abut Nebraska in this case. So you can see the tension there as folks are moving into this new territory, either uh, pro or anti-slavery. <clears throat> Look, the, the name Jayhawk still around today, right? Isn't that the Kansas um, ma uh, mascot, right? <clears throat> the division is shown, I think, clearly here. The Lecompton uh, capital versus the Topeka capital. And what happens is there's two constitutions written, one with Topeka as the capital being a free state, one as Lecompton as the capital as a slave state. So that's how, um, what's the word? I mean, how divided really is the word, how divided the state of Kansas is over this issue of free or slave. Okay. Over time, anti-slavery settlers begin to outnumber. And again, part of that's the land itself is not super conducive, just more conducive to plantation-type agriculture, certainly less so than the South was. But so you see anti-slavery uh, elements gaining an upper hand as we move toward a vote on the Constitution. So there's the problem. We've got division. We've got the uh, pro-slavery folks seeing themselves outnumbered. So what are they going to do? Well, they start throwing out pop propaganda. This happens to be propaganda, if you notice, forcing slavery down the throat of free soilers. So we're jamming slaves down. It's kind of a grim looking picture, but you can see it's more in support of uh, freedom. With We don't want slavery forced down our throat. We want to decide, just like every other state that entered the Union. But now that entry is not predicated on a geographical line. It's predicated on the vote of the people of that state. Okay. 
So that decision, and Douglas is a big part of it, sets the stage for the Lincoln-Douglas, um, the beginnings of. It's not their debates when they're both running for the Senate, which become more famous, but they start to express their opinion. What really happens here, Douglas is already a well-known name around the country. Abraham Lincoln is not. He's really starting to make a name for himself in, in uh, Illinois, but he's not well known around the country. And in fact, Lincoln, I mean, he ran for a lot of offices and the only one he was victorious in before he became president, he won a two year term as a congressman from Illinois. That was it. He lost and everything else. And he's gonna lose to Stephen Douglas in the 1858 Senate race too. Okay. But Lincoln starts to hone his argument against slavery. Now again, footstop, Lincoln is not a radical abolitionist. His goal is to stop the spread. And when he, you know, in his mind, stopping the expansion of slavery does put it on a pathway to extinction. But it's a more gradual extinction because he says it in his first inaugural address. I'm not going to mess with slavery where it already exists. But that's not enough. The fear of abolishment is enough for the southern states to begin seceding, starting with uh, South Carolina in December, almost immediately after the election of 1860. Okay. <laughs> and it, now we have uh, um, Kansas come in as a free state, and Nebraska eventually does come in. So all the violence um, in Kansas doesn't stop it entering the Union as a free state. And now we start to see the balance of power tipping toward free states. California coming in. And if you recall, the map that the uh, ladies used in the 1820 Compromise presentation showed that balance of power, 11-11, 12-12. And it stayed consistent until we get to this era. And then we saw three, four more free states over um, slave states. So Southern slaveholding power also sees, even without the election of Lincoln, they're starting to see their power slipping away, even with the three-fifths compromise still in effect. Um, on top of that, we have immigration. Now, what's happening too is with industrialization, there's an absorption effect, the ability to absorb a lot of these immigrants. But there's an anti-immigrant sentiment there. I hate to say it, but there kind of always has been. There's certain groups we like, and there's certain groups we like in, in smaller doses than others, let's say. Um, Central and Northern European immigrants typically get in without issue. Uh, but Irish Catholics, um, a couple things, they were poor. Being Catholic, there was that resistance of, do they, are they more loyal to the Catholic Church and the Pope than to the country? And with mass immigration, the response you see, this NINA is an acronym, means no Irish need apply. And you start seeing those signs come up uh, in front of businesses that might otherwise hire them, that could need employers, or employees rather. We're gonna see the same thing after the Civil War as the Great Migration start, starts to happen, where you see freedmen moving north in search of opportunity and jobs. And now the sign becomes uh, and BNA, no blacks need apply. Just stay away, we don't want you. So there is stress, there's always stress over immigration. And so, you know, some of these riotous, especially the Irish, right, my ancestors, drink a lot, fight a lot. Um, competing for jobs, it starts this American party, right, a very nationalistic party. And the reason the term know nothings was because if they were asked about it, they were supposed to say, I don't know anything about that, I know nothing. Right, but it's supposed to rise up and stop this immigration. Hmm. Sound familiar? History does repeat itself, and so what we're seeing with the the, the fracturing and, and dissolution of the Whigs, um, these free soil. You saw that free soil idea in the in the propaganda poster, the Liberty Party. There's other smaller parties out there that slowly start to merge, and they merge into what becomes the Republican Party. And so by 1856, the Republican Party is together and powerful enough to nominate a candidate for president. Uh, Fremont runs in 1856. Now, he doesn't win, but it shows that the Republicans are on the rise. One of the key players other than uh, Fremont is this guy, William Seward. We're going to see him again in 1860. He is the prime Republican nominee. 
because he's well known across the country, but he's also tainted with um, kind of a abolitionist, right? A little too radical on the institution of slavery. And so we need somebody that's a little more moderate. And that's where Lincoln comes in. So he starts to hone his message over uh, Kansas, Nebraska. And then he goes on for, I think it was a series of seven debates. And I mean, these things were long. Right? Each guy got an hour to an hour and a half initially. And then they got another half hour to refute the other person's debate. So these were intellectual activities, not these ridiculous, you have 90 seconds to answer so-called debates that we have today. Um, and he, again, he's honing his message. Now he loses, but at this point now he's become a Republican, whereas Douglas was a Democrat. And so we're going to see the two run against each other and a couple more players in 1860. <clears throat> Limit expansion. That's why Seward's a little bit out of step with the party itself. Okay. And they're still hanging on to this idea of exportation, right? That, um, uh, putting folks for um, taking them out of slavery, putting them on a ship, sending them back to Africa, to Liberia. Remember, Lincoln was for that for a while early on. The Republican Party only attracts northern voters. I mean, look at the stance on it. Even if I'm not a slaveholder in the South, I'm not going to cotton on to this Republican Party. And when we get to the election of 1860, look, it's not like Lincoln didn't get a single vote from the South. I'm sure there were some, but he never got a single electoral vote from a Southern state. So that, I mean, that election shows you the sectional divide North to South as clearly as anything. Yeah. <clears throat> 1856, kind of the prelude. Uh, unfortunately, uh, James Buchanan historically has gone down as the worst president we've ever had. All right, he, he's not uh, polluted with some of the, um, the antagonism, some of the uh, destruction in and around bleeding Kansas and Kansas, Nebraska. Uh, so that makes him maybe a, a more palatable candidate. But as the country starts to devolve, and split up. He sits around. He doesn't do anything. So look up any list of worst presidents. He's always top dog worst president. Right? And there's John Fremont, right? The great Pathfinder made his name exploring out uh, west. So he was a nationally known character, um, it, even if so much it was just you know exploration wise. Now he doesn't win, and the party's new enough where that probably helps him not win. But at least they're out there. Okay, and Buchanan wins, especially in the South, because Fre Fremont being a Republican, there's a fear of the Republican Party, even as it comes to, into existence, based on that platform. Okay? So which party represents which section at this point? I think it's fairly clear. The Republicans are a very much a northern phenomenon, and the Democrats, albeit the Democrats, are split. There are northern Democrats against slavery, but in general, the Democrats represent, at least represent more of... Um, the South. Okay? When we get to 1860, you're going to see the Democratic Party actually splits into three pieces effectively. That's the only way Abraham Lincoln wins. This kind of still unknown, nobody, middle of the road guy, you know, not violently anti-slavery, just wants to limit its expansion. And yet he wins the presidency. How does that happen? Okay? Uh, and now this one I am going to skip because I know you guys uh, on Thursday are going to talk about uh, the Dred Scott decision. So think about all of the stuff that we've talked about, all the division based on compromise and fugitive slave law enforcement and or lack of compromise, really. Kansas and Nebraska. I mean, the country is really ripping itself to pieces. And now we're going to see a Supreme Court decision that maybe just maybe puts the last nail in the coffin. Right now, the South doesn't secede over Dred Scott, but boy, does it increase that. It's now the Grand Canyon between the North and the South over the issue of slavery. Okay, so that's why I skipped that because you guys are going to talk about it. There, I skipped it. Um, Republicans start to smell a rat. It, it, all this stuff going on, especially the Dred Scott uh, decision. They talk about this great slaveholding conspiracy that the South is uh, 
kind of covertly trying to hang on to power. And they're right. Um, I don't know if it's a giant conspiracy. Uh, they say, you know what, look, the Missouri Compromise, which worked for 30 years, was clear. And yet we have all this chipping away, and some of it via northern folks, popular sovereignty, right, Stephen Douglas. But these these follow-on events, Dred Scott, Kansas-Nebraska Act, um, the this kind of steps back in time a little bit because we know Kansas came in as a free state. But the idea of that Lecompton Constitution, that Kansas, the slaveholding faction in Kansas says, we want to come in as a slave state. Right? They're saying, look, all this stuff going on in support of slavery, something's afoot here. Right? And so here, that's where this debate really happens, Douglas and Lincoln, over the uh, Dred Scott decision and the idea of popular sovereignty. So that does help bring Lincoln to the national eye because a lot of this, there was big crowds and it was published in um, bigger papers like Chicago, which gets worldwide reading. Hey, Douglas is like, hey man, uh, you know, this uh, popular sovereignty idea, uh, people can keep slavery out if they don't want it. And so Douglas, I, I put this down, Douglas wins the battle. He wins the Senate race in 1858, but he loses the war eventually. Because when we get to the election, you're going to see he only wins one state, and it's not even his home state. All right. Remember John Brown, the quote about, I see the uh, sins of the country being purged only with blood. Um, that comes after this. So he plans a guerrilla-style attack. Him, his son, some followers, um, and kind of quirkily, sadly, the first death, if you want to call this the prelude to civil war, is a freed slave who's part of the insurrection. And they plan to attack um, the arsenal, right, the, uh, the storage for weapons at Harper's Ferry. And Brown thinks that if they take the arsenal and they can get a bunch of freed blacks and maybe some slaves to join him, they can arm them up and start a big slave insurrection far greater than the uh, Nat Turner rebellion of the 1830s. Okay, so they do that. They take the arsenal, but then they are surrounded. The other thing is almost nobody comes to his aid at this point. So he's taken the arsenal, but he has nobody to help with the insurrection, so they're kind of stuck there. And the government calls on Captain Robert E. Lee to lead a contingent of Marines down, capture John Brown, which he does, and several are killed in the uh, the firefight at the arsenal. Brown's not, but he's uh, captured alive, tried for treason, and he's hung for treason. Okay, some abolitionists honor him as a martyr. I mentioned that the idea that he's dying for the right to free the slaves. Southerners have an opposite effect, and we see that with almost everything, that there's an equal and opposite reaction north to south, either pro or anti, on all these events happening. Why would, they, uh, why would Southerners be up in arms? Because this idea of a northern white man leading a slave insurrection, and remember the population densities from 50-50 up to 90% slave in some areas, any kind of insurrection could be disastrous for the South. So there is that fear. And so a rather famous painting, uh, Tragic Prelude, um, and you can see, if you look at some of the imagery elements in the background, that's John Brown right there in the center. Right? Um, and you can see Confederate Union forces, the idea of a firestorm, tornado, just death and disaster. And yet still in the background, the movement of folks out West filling in some of this territory. Look, just because there's a civil war going on doesn't mean people aren't still moving out west. The Homestead Act allowing people to move out west occurs during the Civil War. So there's an actual picture of John Brown, kind of a scary looking guy. Okay? And so uh, mass meeting, Captain John Brown to be executed. Like, well, wait a minute. The, he's going to be killed. So the anti-slavery folks were using this as a look what's happening look what slavery is doing to this country it's ripping us apart and now a white man who wanted to help end slavery is going to be hung for it holy moly that is a rallying cry for the anti-slavery folks and so some of the people you may have heard of henry david Thoreau, right walden um predicts that brown would be 
uh, a martyr, would strengthen abolitionist feeling, and he does. And so more and more of the folks that, yes, we had the abolitionists, but that don't care about slavery folks, we're seeing more move toward, leaning toward abolition, both from Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, events like this, and the South saw it as, man, these Northerners are plotting against us. So uh, Senator Toombs from Georgia, defend yourself. The enemy is at your door. The enemy is the North. And, you know, it, it sounds hyperbolic, perhaps, but I still, I see elements of this in the country today that we're castigating the other side as the enemy. They're not just Democrats. They're not just Republicans. They're the enemy. No, because the end of act, or words like that can be disastrous. And we already saw, you know, the attempted insurrection at the Capitol. So we keep up on this path. Things are going to get uglier. I promise. Right? In the crowd watching John Brown hung is uh, a young instructor at Virginia Military Institute, VMI, Thomas J. Jackson, a.k.a. Stonewall Jackson. All right, blood and treasure, kind of getting toward the finish line here. Um, as we approach the Civil War, leadership, who has it? That's kind of unfair to say right now because we're still the United States. So Robert E. Lee, who becomes one of the best, of the best Southern battlefield commander of the war, is still in the United States military. In general, some of the better commanders end up uh, going on to the Confederate side. So Union leadership early in the war is rather dreadful. And Lincoln, I mean, he had a very limited military experience. He fought for a short time in the Black Hawk Wars against the natives in Illinois. He struggled with a command and control structure, how to command these giant armies across this whole country. So leadership who had it as we split up the South generally has a better go of it. Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, was the Secretary of War right, on the cabinet uh, in Washington. So he has a better idea what's going on. Now, he's not a great leader either, but he has a leg up. Treasure, who had it? The North, much more industrialized and able thus to provide more beans and bullets for its troops. And population-wise, um, the North has more. So if, i.e. when, the Civil War starts to become a war of attrition, it's really uh, the beginning of the end for the South. The South had to get some quick, distinct victories, win by not losing, hope the North got tired. Lincoln gets unelected, right, in the 1864 election, and now, sue for peace, Confederate States of America exist. That was kind of the big picture plan. <clears throat> I throw this in just, uh, we talked about it um, last class, but I want to actually show you guys just so you believe me. Here's the uh, letter from uh, Grace Bedell. Uh, you, know, you can read it, you can pause the video and read it, but the idea that the ladies would like you and they make your husbands vote for you if you grow some whiskers, right? As we saw, Lincoln was clean shaven at that point. And so here's his response, your very agreeable letter. I mean, can you imagine? Um, I have three sons. Uh, with their mother whiskers not worn any do you think they would call it a silly piece of affection right would it be vain for me to do it but of course what happens when you think of lincoln you think of the big hat and the beard right so he does good work grace bedell there you go <clears throat> strange looking guy and six foot four thin lanky if you do ever get to the american history museum they have one of his uh, suits on display mostly wore black and white and just how thin he was, kind of gangly, deep-set eyes, sorrowful, right? He dealt, fought with uh, depression, especially after his first uh, love, Ann Rutledge, died. But he fought with that throughout his life, the death of his youngest son. Um, but, of course, here's more of what we expect of Lincoln. And just crazy hair, too. There's a scene in the movie Lincoln about just being unable to tame his hair. Air. It always looks like he just woke up. All right, so talking about wrapping this up as we get to 1860, because this is the, the event that sets off the secession of the South. 
And if you look, remember, um, Stephen Douglas was supposed to be the hot dog, right? He was supposed to win this whole thing. He wins one state, not even his home state. He wins Missouri. But if you look at the list of candidates here, Lincoln, um, Douglas wins the one, Breckenridge wins throughout the South, and this uh, Bell wins a few of the border states. Notice Virginia, there is no West Virginia yet. That comes as, uh, during the Civil War. So effectively, either Democratic elements, North and South, or this Constitutional Party kind of Democrat offshoot, you can see how the Democratic Party splits the vote among its really three candidates. Notice Lincoln didn't win a single state south of, you know, we call it the Mason-Dixon line, uh, the Ohio River, but he wins all these heavy hitters, right? The huge electoral vote count states, which show you where the population density is in America right now. In the industrial belt, the rust belt as we call it now, but New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, moving out to Indiana, Illinois. And you can see how relatively sparsely populated some of these deep south states are, even California and Oregon, okay? So Lincoln wins enough. The Blue Star is to a, uh, a U.S. Election Atlas website. It's really good. It breaks it down as to who won down to the county level, if you're interested. So we know that the popular vote doesn't matter. And again, when the popular vote is split up four ways, it's no wonder Lincoln doesn't get but about 40%. But he gets those electoral, those heavy hitting electoral vote states. So he ends up winning the election. And as soon as that happens now, the South is like, this is all our worst fears manifest. Even though Lincoln is going to tell him, I am not going to mess with slavery where it exists. That's, that's simply not enough. They see the beginning of the end. So rather than submit to that, South Carolina leads the contingent of the first seven Confederate states out of the Union. So right before Christmas and then after New Year's, we see the next states leave the Union. Okay? Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, those deep South states. So now we've got seven. But you think about it, you're like, well, darn, um, I thought there were 11 Confederate states. Well, what happens is um, as we move toward actual fighting, there's shots being fired, um, the other four, what become Confederate states, will follow. Okay, And here's Buchanan doing nothing to help shape a compromise. Like, you know, what can we do? He kind of just sits back and, oh, well, you know. So Lincoln's in this untenable position. The election, just like now, the beginning of November. But um, the inauguration back then was in March. So he's got this huge window where he has effectively no power to do anything. Now what he does do is he starts writing letters and working with people in uh, Washington over the issue, but he can't come out and actively do anything like the president could. So he's in a tough spot. Okay? So after inauguration, uh, another what, five weeks, uh, the South fires on Fort Sumter as it's being resupplied, and that is what starts the, the movement of the next four. And probably most critical, the state of Virginia coming out of the Union going to the Confederacy. Because Lincoln calls for soldiers. Hey, they fired on Fort Sumter. That's a federal fort. 75,000 troops for 90 days. What does that tell you? It tells me Lincoln thinks this is going to be short and sweet. That that's all he needs for 90 days? Hmm. And both sides think that. It's going to be a short war and we're going to win it. That's almost always the case, isn't it? So here you see the rest of the states. And immediately after they call up a troops, Virginia leaves. And now it's true that Winfield Scott, the overall military commander, um, calls on Robert E. Lee and asks him to take command of the Union Army. And he turns down the request. He says, no, I cannot pull, draw my sword against my state, my home state of Virginia. And he also says he never thought he'd see a president raise an army to invade his own country. So Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina. Now there's a couple other states that never actually leave the Union, like Ten or, uh, Kentucky. Those are known as border states. But they still are slave-holding, slave-leaning states, kind of support the Confederacy, but don't leave the Union. Okay, so let's hit a quick review. Popular sovereignty, the idea that as states come in,
the people of the state decide, are we going to be a free state or a slave state? Simply said. Okay. So previously, what had governed that? Well, it's simple. The 1820 Compromise. Why no longer? Because if I'm north of that line but vote to come in as a slave state, that's the idea. So you can see how that line is effectively erased. So anywhere in the country now can become free or slave. So this last chance, Crittenden compromised. And you would think Abraham Lincoln, man, on the brink of civil war, would he go for this? Um, Crittenden basically goes back and tries to reinstate the compromise of 1820 that maybe we can kick this can down the road. Maybe we can mend fences enough to come back together and not have disunion, okay? And you look, you look at what his, his compromise is. It's verbatim from the Missouri Compromise. Lincoln says no. Why? Why wouldn't he at least give it a shot? Well, you could say he was being hypocritical perhaps, but I think he had a valid point. He said, I was elected. I am the president of the United States. And at the time of that election, the United States was all the states. And he said, I was elected on the platform to stop the spread of slavery. And I said so much. And so now if I go back, I'm going to become ineffective uh, and maybe not able to stop anything in the future. So no, I'm not going to accept this. I'm not going to change my approach. And the Crittenden Compromise wasn't the only one, but all of these fail. And I think a quote from Lincoln here at the end kind of sums that up. Okay, so here's your Confederate map. The first seven are blue. The four that left after Lincoln's call up of troops are kind of this purple. And then you can see what I called the border states. West Virginia, yes, but that doesn't exist just yet. Um, Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, Missouri. Remember, Missouri is a slave state. Indian Territory, uh, still not Oklahoma yet, so I'm not sure why that's on there, but be that as it may. And you can see the dates as to when they left. Remember, not president yet. Modern times, yes, his inauguration will be complete, but it's, not, it's still another five, six weeks off. So he's talking about this idea of increasing demands from the South and kind of why he did not go for the Crindid Compromise. And he talks about giving them personal liberty bills and they will pull in the slack, hold on, and insist the border states compromise. Give them that, they'll pull in the slack and demand the Crittenden compromise. He's like, whatever I do to appease the South, they're going to say, okay, and then ask for something more. Okay, ask for something more. He says, I'm just not going down that road. And by starting down that path with the Crittenden compromise would put him in that position. So he's not going to do it. And this is good. I mean, it uses some funny terms, but by no act or complicity of mine shall the Republican Party become a mere sucked egg, all shell with no principle. And the principle is I won the election fair and square based on the Constitution. If you don't like it, then deal with it politically. So I will suffer death before I'll consent or advise my friends to consent to any concession or compromise which looks like buying the privilege of taking possession of the government to which we have a constitutional right. We're not going to compromise on these things. I ran on this platform. I won on this platform. That's the way it is. So I hope that kind of explains why Lincoln would disagree with this compromise that, who knows, it's an imponderable. Would it have been, uh, precluded war? Probably not. I think he's right that it would just um, egged on a la Adolf Hitler in appeasement by Neville Chamberlain, right? Hitler demands more and more and more of the Sudetenland and eventually takes all of Czechoslovakia. So kind of the same idea. And I think Lincoln was right to stand up for it. So there you go. We are right on the edge, right? We've already mentioned the idea of the firing on Fort Sumter, which starts the war. Lincoln finally does get into office, but now the struggle, the real struggle begins. And the first big battle that we're going to see... Um, in chapter 15 is the first battle of Manassas or Bull Run as it's called in the north just outside Washington DC okay so yeah look just under an hour so I'm gonna shut up before it hits the hour mark and uh, I'll see you guys for we've got Dred Scott coming up on uh, Thursday uh, paper due Friday and then finishing up the uh, the assassination presentation and uh, taking the final and then a little break before we start 2112. So see you in class, end of the week.